chapter 6 and verse 25. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Children, you're dismissed to your class this morning. And by all means, please have a good time. <laughs> All right. Are you there? Matthew chapter 6, verse 20, beginning at verse 25 this morning. If you're there, say amen. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. And it reads like this. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor your body as to what you will put on it, uh, put, uh, put on. Is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He says, look at the birds of the air, that they don't sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth, more, much, uh, worth much more than they? And who of you, by, worry, by being worried, can add a single hour of, to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil nor spin. Yet they say to the, the, yet I say to you that not even, a, not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? And he says, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear or for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows what you need, all, th that, that you need all of these things. But, I, but seek first, he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The title of my message today is I'm not worried. Amen. I'm not worried. Uh, we've been in a series called Finding Freedom, and I'm really, really tempted to want to go keep on going because there's just so many messages that I could preach about helping people to find freedom. But uh, I, I don't know about you, but in my life, I have, I have always been a worrier. Not, I'd like to say warrior, but I, I'm going to say worrier. I'm probably more of a warrior for worrying. Amen? Did you know that 85% of, what, of, what, uh, uh, that 85 of people worry about stuff that never really happens? What if? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? And so 85% of people worry about things that never, ever happen. There's a Swedish proverb that says this, worry often gives a small thing a big shadow. Have you ever been worried about something, and when you're worried about it, as you, and you're, you start allowing that fear to build up on the inside of you, and as it's building up on the inside of you, when it finally something finally happens, it didn't happen at all like you thought it was going to happen? You're like, oh, that, I was not expecting that. Sometimes we worry about. Sometimes we worry about conflict with people. Oh, you know that that that, that sister's offended with me. That brother's offended with me. That person, you know, that person doesn't like me. Or this person, I just know they're going to confront me. I just know. And then we find out that that's not even the case. That they they've been afraid to even approach you just to talk to you because you look intimidated because you're worried that they're mad at you, and so you give them the the the, the mad dog look. And so they look at you like, oh, I don't want to approach that person. They're probably pretty mean. In all essence, though, you're worried about something else. And the Bible says, as Christians, we are told not to worry, and yet that's the one thing we often do. That's the one thing we often be, walk in is worry. Sometimes we worry about the unknown. 
Sometimes we worry about the unknown. We, we're not sure of what's going to happen. And so we worry. What about the economy? What about the World War III? What about, what about, what about? We worry about the past. We worry, you know, what, am I, what, if, what if people from my past show up? And, I, you know, I don't want them to come to my church because they know my past. You know, hey, I'm so glad that they, they you, you, you know, they should see you from changed and transformed, right? But we're worried, oh, what about my past? I, wor- I did so many things in my past. I'm worried that people will find out and then they won't like me. You know what? Who cares? Sometimes we're worried about the results of a, po- of a bad decision that we made. You ever made a bad decision? <laughs> As a pastor, I've made a lot of them. Oh, pastor, you're so wise. Oh, you don't know this, half the stories I could probably tell you. The results, sometimes we look and we say, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I shouldn't have made that. Mess. Oh, I shouldn't have made that investment. Oh, I, I tried buying into Bitcoin and then I, it came back, that Bitcoin came back and bit me, you know, <laughs> because I, I, I shouldn't have bought into that. I shouldn't have, have given into that. I, I, I bought more than I should have. I bought more than I, I could have afforded. A friend of mine told me about it and I bought a whole bunch of it and now I don't have money to pay my rent. Sometimes we worry about the results of any decisions that we make. Sometimes, have you ever been so worried about a decision that you know you need to make, but you know that if you make, you're afraid of, you're worried that you're going to make the wrong decision so you don't make a decision, or you're worried that if you make that decision, other people aren't going to like that decision so you make no decision, or you're worried that that, that, that decision will have lasting impact, uh, in, uh, lasting negative impact in your life so you choose not to make a decision, and you live in worry. And what happens is this, though, is that when we give in to worry, worry begins to lead us away from God. Worry begins to cause us to back off in trusting God. And worry begins to, to, to push us more toward entertaining our fears than feeding our faith. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22 says, And the one on whom seed has, was sown among the thorns, this is the man or the person who hears the word and the worry of the world and the, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. He says here that the, the, that the thorns begin to choke out the word of God. You can come to church and your pastor will preach, don't worry, and yet we worry. The pastor will say, don't fear, and yet we fear. Because, and we entertain those fears, and we entertain that worry. And then we start thinking to ourselves, Look, he says, well, is it wrong, pastor, to want to make money? It's not wrong to want to make money. It's wrong to want to live for only making money. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. It's wrong when you live for your wealth. It's when you allow your, your you, you, you're like, Pastor, I got to work, I got to work, I got to work. Got to make that bread, got to make that paper. You know, got to make, make it rain, got to make it rain. <laughs> right? So, got to make the lettuce, Pastor, got to make the lettuce. What else do they call it today? I don't even know. And he says, And the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word of God. All of that worry begins to, be, to do something inside of you that pushes you farther and farther away from God. And I, and I know this from experience because, like I said, I naturally sometimes, I, I, I don't want to say naturally, but I naturally give in to worry. Sometimes I'll make a, I know as a pastor, I can, I, can, I can walk strong in my authority, and then I confront somebody, and then they get offended, and then I'm, a, then I'm worried that they're going to leave the church, or that they're going to leave God, or they're going to stop their service. And that's a tool of the enemy to distract you from serving God. The purpose of worry is to take your eyes off of God and put your eyes on your situation. It's to say, you know, hey, hey, look, don't look at the cross don't look at what Jesus did. Don't look at what God is doing in your life. Look at the problem. Focus on the problem. The disciples were out in the boat 
in the in the water, and a storm rose up in the, out in the water in the in in the in the the, 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 the the Sea of Galilee, they're out there, they're crossing over, and the wind rose up, and they began to have, they were caught in the midst of a storm, and the disciples were more focused on their storm than on the Savior who was coming toward them. See, when you worry, you're saying that you don't trust God. You're saying that you do not trust God to take care of your needs and to meet your needs. When you worry, you're saying, God, I know you're God, and I know you can do the impossible, but I know that my situation is greater than you. I know that my situation is too impossible for you to handle, God. And so we, we believe in our hearts that, that's, that, that we, we begin to entertain those thoughts. Has there been a time in your life where you, you say, you know, God, um, you know, I, I, know I, I know you said that you'll provide for all of my needs according to your riches and glory, but, you know, I think maybe the problem is we need to get off our butts. Amen? And stop worrying about what God can or cannot do in our life. When we worry, we start, to, to down, we start on, a, on, on a downward spiral that leads us away from God. We start over, with overthinking uh, and entertaining the what-if thoughts. What if? What if? You know, but what if? Or <coughs> even if somebody from our, somebody from our, our, our community group, they come and they, they're trying to encourage us. Your pastor tries to encourage you. Your friends try to encourage you. Everybody tries to encourage you. But we still have the what if going on in our head. What if? What if this doesn't work? What if this business doesn't take off? What if this happens? What if my husband leaves me? What if my wife leaves me? What if the doctor tells me that I've got cancer? I mean, I've, I, I have this problem, and it started in my toe and travels up to my knee, and now it's in my hip, and then it goes up to my shoulder and across the other shoulder and back down to my other hip, and then it's hitting my kidney, and I had three uncles that died from that. What if? And we entertain, we entertain fear. We entertain it. What does it mean to entertain something? When somebody comes over your house, yeah, it starts with opening the door. It starts with letting, allowing it to settle in and become comfortable. It, then, we're, we're, are you want something to drink? You want some food? Are you hungry? We begin to nurture it. We begin to hang out with it. We begin to talk about it. I don't, have, have you ever had, have you ever been in a place where somebody came to your door and you open the door and you're like, oh, it's you, close the door. <laughs> As Christians, we shouldn't do that. But when it comes to worry, right? You need, to check your, you need to check your smart camera, your door ring. Hey, worry's at the door. Never mind. Leave it on the doorstep, <laughs> right? So we, 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 we begin to entertain fear, and, and we begin to determine the outcome before it ever happens. We begin to, to settle on, on the ending before it ever starts off. We're kind of already coming up with the conclusion, the ending. We're even, we're even processing the credits in our mind instead of, and instead of saying, you know, God, God's got this. And then we begin to, not only just do we begin to entertain it, but then what happens is it's not just entertaining because once something has taken root inside of your heart and inside of your mind and inside of your soul, it's not enough that it just starts to occupy, but then we begin to confess it. We begin to confess and speak out. You know, you, you, you understand how powerful your words are? You understand that you have the power of death and life in your tongue? Do you understand that what you say matters to God and God takes what you say in faith even if that faith is negative faith, and he puts it in, into action. Sometimes, I'm not saying that God is going to put your 
your, your fears into action, but we give into our fear more than we give into our faith. We begin to confess our fear. And that what happens is we've allowed that fear and that worry to begin to, to, to take seat and take root. Not only that, it's kind of like a guest who comes to visit and never leaves. Somebody who, who they begin to settle into your heart, into your home, and you're like, man, now, now you're like, you're, you're, you're so upset that they won't leave that now you don't even eat dinner with them. You eat it in your room, right? Right? You, you eat it in your room because you want to hang out with them because you, you don't have the boldness to, con- to confront them and tell them, hey, you know what, bro? You, you need to go, all right? I love you, but you need to grow, right? I said, you shouldn't say that to fear or worry and say, you know, hey, worry, I love you, but you need to go. No, worry, you know what? You've controlled me long enough. Fear, you've controlled me long enough. I refuse to walk in fear. I refuse to walk in in worry. I will not allow you to control and dominate my life. So once we begin to confess things, then then we wander off to find other alternatives that will help to soothe our worry. Think about that. I can't get this off my mind. That's why I drink, Pastor. That's why, that's why I get high. So I can get my mind off my worries. What you need to do is talk to God, put it in God's hands, and leave it there, and let God do what he needs to do. I, there was a saying back in the 80s and 90s, let go and let God. Remember that? We need to, we need to bring that t-shirt back. You know, let go and let God. We need to let go and let God do what he needs to do in us so that we don't continue to carry the worry. And it's not only, it, it, it's only when it's too late. Listen, it's only when it's too late from being more focused on, on the world or more focused on our worry or more focused on our fear that we want to come back to God. When we should have trusted him from the beginning. It's like that duped lover that says, you know, I... I'm going to go look for the grass, greener grass somewhere else. I didn't find any, you know, so I'm coming back to you. No, 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 you don't get a second chance on that, bro. Listen, you say, I want, I, I want God from the beginning to the end. And I will trust God, even when everything looks, and let, trust me, even in the times when it looks like it's the darkest, even in times when it looks like the bank is about ready to take your home, You have to have faith to say God is on my side. He will never leave me, nor will he forsake me. But what if they take my home? What if they take your home? God must have something else for you somewhere else. What if I lose my job? Great, then God must be promoting you to another job somewhere else. it's, It's all in how you look at things. It's all in how you focus. It's it's about what you look at that matters. Because what your eyes are focused on, that's what you're going to con- confess. So, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this message, and I thought, why do, why do we worry? I mean, why is it that we as humans worry? Well, worry comes from being more focused on the world than on God. When your heart is more focused on the things of the world, then on the things of God, you're going to begin to worry. The Bible says in Mark 4.19, But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Understand this. They end, the, Satan wants to make you unfruitful. He wants to cause you to become an unfruitful Christian. His, his number one, he's got two goals, in, in two missions for every single person in the world. One is to keep you from being a Christian, and two is for, to keep you from staying a Christian. If you are not, you are not, a, uh, if you are not a believer, he's going to do everything he can to steal the word of God before it takes root in your heart. But it's up to us to cultivate and nurture the root, that, that the root of the word of God so that it can grow and we can become prosperous and we can thrive and we can become fruitful Christians. But, the, but, but if we don't do anything with it, the enemy comes in and steals the seed. And then we become, then we, then we be basically, we just occupy space in a church. Can I, can I be bold and honest with you? See, God's word 
is intended to drive you toward God. The more you hear the word of God, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be at a place where it's, it's saying, you know, you're bad, you're no good, you're nothing, we're all going to hell. Come on, everybody, come to the altar and let's get saved. God's word is, in, is, is intended to give you an appetite for more of God. Come on. I, I, we, I went to this one place one time. It was a cookout. And I, I, I'm not kidding you. They had the most delicious carne asada ever. And I, I, I've tasted some pretty good stuff, but this was like, it was just, it like you, it's like, almost like chocolate. You put it in your mouth, and it just, you didn't even have to chew it. It just melted in your mouth. And you're like, oh my gosh, this, what kind of carne asada? This is like from heaven. This is amazing. I mean, I had revelations of uh, revelations, divine revelations come into my mind. If I would have put that on the top of my head, my tongue would have baited my face trying to get to it because it was so good. And, 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 and the funny thing was, I, just, I didn't have just a piece I had like a little bite, and then I was like, oh, I want some more of that. And then I ate that, and then I wanted some more of that. That's the way the Word of God is. Just one little taste of the Word of God. If you truly taste it, if you too, as they say in Spanish, saborear, if you, if you just kind of savor it, you, you don't just, you know, like, I got, I, sometimes Pastor Rose has to tell me to come up for air when we eat, you know. Come up for air. <laughs> you know, hey, <laughs> going a little too fast here. And we sit down like we're at the lunch table and we only have 20, 20 minutes to eat, you know. And 15 of that was already occupied by standing in line. And so we're, hit, we're sitting there and we're... And we don't get to enjoy. And how many times do we read the Word of God, do we read God's Word like we eat our food? Right? Oh, I need a word for today, God. Judas went out and hung himself. Okay, Lord. One more, one more confirmation. One more confirmation. Go therefore and do likewise. Okay, I got my word from God today. Y'all laugh, but there are people that do that. Instead of saying, God, I want to take some time and just read, even if it's a couple of scriptures and digest it. Savor it. And God's word is intended to drive you toward God. And the devil knows that, that if he can turn your, your affection, if he can turn your desires of, for the worldly possessions and for worldly things and for a worldly mentality, he can cause you to begin to worry. Think about it. Every one of us, and maybe, maybe one or two are with exception, but almost every one of us want nice, nice things. Every one of us wants to drive nice cars. Every one of us wants to, 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 to have uh, $100,000 or more in the bank. How many of us have, have bought lottery tickets praying, God, let this be the one. God, I will never have to work the rest of my days, right? Come on now, you know I'm telling you the truth. And the Lord knows that. The devil knows that if he can turn you, he, he, he says, your mind is still on the things of the world. Your mind is still on worldly possessions. Your mind is still, when, when you can, here's a good test for you to see if your mind is on the, uh, if you're on worldly possessions, okay? Take your most favorite possession and give it away. Not, I'm not, ta not talking about your children, your husband, or wife, okay? <laughs> In a, but I'm talking your most favorite possession, as long as it's paid off, give it away and not, not give it away, but don't say, I have enough money to buy another one. Oh, I wanted to, I'm going to give the 65 inch away because I actually wanted an 80 anyways. Why don't you give, why don't you purchase the 80 and give it away? Why don't you give the 65 and the 80 away? Um, well, uh, I mean, what am I, how am I going to, if you've got to make excuses, then your heart is bound by the things of the world. And the devil knows that. That's why we worry. We worry. Look, we even worry about who's winning the games. 
I've seen, I've in church seen people watching the NFL network on their phone during church. And then they get mad because their team loses. No wonder your team lost. You're sacrilege in the house of God. <laughs> no, I, listen. When your mind is on the things of the world, you're going to be naturally worried. So when you begin to worry, it, it, when you worry about money, then you're saying God can't provide you the money. When you're worried about healing or your sickness, then you're saying that God can't heal you. When you're worried about social, your, your social influence in, in people's lives, then you're saying that God is not sufficient to fill the void in your life. And so when you begin to worry, it almost always draws you away from God. Worry also causes a lack of confidence in God. The Bible says in Mark, Mark chapter 4, verse 38, it says this. It says, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Well, think about this. Jesus is in the boat with them, and they're worried that they themselves are going to drown. So when we begin to say, God, don't you care? Don't you care that I'm going through Don't you care that I, I, I'm, I don't have a job? Don't you care that I'm down to 50 cents in my bank account? Don't you care? What we're really doing is we're, we're, we're saying, God, I don't trust you. But I want you to understand this, that God, God cares for the sparrows and for the flowers. And those are created creation. He did, not create the, he did not create the sparrows in his image. He didn't create the flowers of the field in his image. And he clothes them and takes care of them. How much more will he take care of his creation that he made in his image and in his likeness? How much more will he take care of his son's and daughters. We are the children of God. We are. You're the child of God. What child does not, the Bible says, that does not ask his father for bread, will, will his father give him a stone? My daughter Jaden is always questioning. You know, she, she, my daughter has a specific meal plan that she likes to eat. We go to Subway, the foot-long Subway on, on Italian uh, crusted, herb, uh, er, crusted herb bread. And then she likes to have the turkey and likes to have the uh, American cheese and lettuce and tomato only with mayonnaise. She doesn't like oil on it, doesn't like the peppers, doesn't like, she likes maybe some mushrooms. You can throw some mushrooms on there every now and then as a special treat. And she also likes the two chocolate chip cookies. She has a specific meal. And then she'll text me, can you get me something from Subway? Okay, sure, I'd love, I'd, I'll get you something. What do you want? <clears throat> um, and then she goes through and be, proceeds to, and don't make sure that it's not, and make sure that it, Mija, I'm your father. I know exactly what you want, even sometimes when you don't know that you want it. The Bible says the Father, Heavenly Father knows what we have need of even before we ask Him. I remember one time, um, I went to go preach at a church when I was young and in, in the tra as a traveling evangelist I went to go preach at a church and, as I'm, and uh, I'm standing there and I said Lord um, you know the last offering was not that great and I came here by faith Lord God I'm, I'm, I'm doing what you called me to do but Lord I, I could sure use I could sure use at least $500 you know because I got to fix my car my car was not it was acting up but Lord I could sure use $500 if you could, you could uh, provide in any way. <clears throat> and then I said, Lord, um, you know, I, I need one of those uh, knives that, that has like all of the different things so that sometimes I can put that in my glove compartment box. Lord, if, if by any chance, I didn't say it out loud. I didn't tell the person standing next to me. I thought it, just thought it. That night when they gave me the check, they gave me a, a, a check for our for my speaking engagement. They said this also came in the offering. 
What was it? It was exactly what I needed. It was a Swiss Army knife. God knew what I needed even before I asked him. I didn't have to, well, I need to go. I, don't, I can't afford to because I got to put this money in my car. Nothing. Deuteronomy chapter 28 <clears throat> says this. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all the people from the one, end, one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you or your fathers have not known. Among those nations, among those nations you shall find no rest, and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and despair of soul. You know what worry causes? It causes an abandonment from God. Abandoning God is a result of worry. Eventually we start, we walk away and say, you know, we start just stop going to church. Hey, think about this. How many times have any of us, and I'm saying us, not just myself, how many times have any of us stopped going to the house of God? And if you look back, honestly look back, what did it start with? Worry. Worry. Because worry took you away from walking, walking that walk you're supposed to be walking with God. And you know what happens is as it does that, as it does that, it give, you begin to develop a trembling heart. That's a worry. My heart is trembling within me. I'm fearful of what's going on around me. But I don't have control of it. And here, what we look at as we're reading this, Moses, is what he's doing is he's giving his final speech to the Israelites. He's standing there on the, on the mountainside, and he's talking to the entire congregation of, Israel, uh, of Equip Church Israel, you know. Uh, and he's speaking to them. It's my, it's my sermon. Let me preach it how I want it, okay? Um, some of you are like, Equip Church Israel? Where's that in the Bible? Um, <clears throat> Moses is giving his final speech to the Israelites, and, 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 and he says this. First thing he says, if they abandon God, they're going to be scattered. The second thing he says is they will, they will worship, they'll begin to worship false gods. The third thing he tells them is that they will have no rest. And the fourth thing he says to them is they, have, they will have an anxious mind and a despairing heart. And the fifth thing he tells them is they will live in constant suspense. Doesn't that sound like worry? When you begin to, 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 to give in to your worries, be given to your fears, as you be, are bound by that fear, that, that, that worry and that fear, the first thing that happens is it, it, it causes you to separate yourself from God, separate yourself from the people of God, separate yourself from the things of God, and then you begin to start entertaining false idols in your life. You begin to watch more TV. You begin to do more things to put in place of worshiping and serving God, and then you, you find that there's just no rest. There's just no rest from your worry, no rest from anything, and then as you, be, as you begin to develop an anxious mind, you constantly are constantly working. Now i got to work two or three jobs to, to be able to entertain this and to entertain that and to do this and to do that. Pastor, I just got a lot. I don't have a lot on my mind right now. I just don't have time to, to go to church. I've had somebody tell me one time, I don't have time for God right now. Worrying has nothing to offer you and cannot, and, and worry, let me understand me when I say that worry cannot change anything for your good. God is the only one that can change anything for your good. Worry can't do that. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 27, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? No, but scientifically, science has proven that worrying actually takes an hour Every time, the more, for every hour you worry, you also subtract an hour uh, from your life. Can you imagine? Can you go back and actually calculate the many times that you were worried and add up the hours of worry and, and then begin to deduct that from your life? You'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm dying tomorrow. Now you're worried about dying. <laughs> Here's the, the number three. Let me give you the cure. The cure for worry. The cure for worry is a God-centered life. The cure for worry is a life that is focused on God. When you're, when you're focused on God, your, your, your mind is filled with peace. When you're focused on God, 
your mind is at ease because you know that God is on your side. Isaiah 26, 3 says this, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust you. I love that. Because they trust you. You're going to keep me in perfect peace. He didn't say partial peace, a kind of a peace, a sort of a peace. Uh, it, it's like peace. No, he said, you will keep me in perfect peace. You know what? When you translate that, I think of the word shalom. Because shalom is translated into overall peace, health, mind, body, soul, and spirit. Shalom. He will give you perfect peace. Peace, and then he says, those whose minds are steadfast. Steadfast. Steadfast means that you're constantly thinking on the things of God and never rest from thinking about those things. Like some of us think about our jobs, or some of us think about our kids, or some of us think about our money. The same way that those things occupy your mind, but your mind is occupied with thinking about God. Why? Because they trust him. He is the peace that passes understanding. When you're worried, you get this peace inside of you. As you trust God, you say, God, I'm, I know the doctor said that this is going to happen. And I understand that they're, do, they're doing what they're trained to do. But your word says, God, whose report shall we believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. So I'm calling on Dr. God. I'm calling on Dr. Jesus to give me a, 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 a second opinion. Come on. Hey, Dr. J, there you go. I like Dr. Jesus. He's the peace that passes understanding. So even in the midst of when everything, all, all, everything is going wrong, Everything is happening, turmoil in your home, finances are in chaos, you're, 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 you're looking for a job, can't find a job, even when there's out there, not even Taco Bell wants to hire you. And you're like, man, I'm, I, I'm, I, I remember there was a time in my life when, when Pastor Rose and I, we were, we were making, trying to make ends meet one end to the other, we're just trying to make it meet, and it just never seemed, just when we got to the end, some things like somebody moved the ends. And then I, get, I got laid, let go from my job. And so I'm out there looking for a job, and I'm trying to find a job in what I'm qualified to do. Nobody wants to hire me. So after a while, I said, you know what, I'll, just, I'll go work at McDonald's. I don't care if I've got to mop floors and clean toilets. I need to f feed my family. And I remember sitting across the table from a, a, the, the manager of a McDonald's saying, please, I need a job. I need to take care of my family. I need to feed my family. I don't have any... I, and so I've, I've been trying everywhere else to get a job, and I can't seem to get a job. Well, I'll clean floors. I'll wipe floors. It doesn't bother me to make fries. I'll make fries. I just need to put food on the table for my family. And they said to me, well, I'm sorry, but you're overqualified. I'm overqualified to make fries? How hard is that? We're, 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 afraid, that, we're afraid that if we hire you, that you won't be satisfied, and we'll have trained you for nothing. I said, I, I need a job. I need to pay my bills. I took everything that I had. I had a guitar, a collector's edition jazz guitar, electric guitar, and I sold it at a pawn shop to put food on the table because I, was, I needed to take care of my family. And, and, and during that time, I would, like to, I would honestly like to be able to say, I had perfect peace. I was in the, I was, there was peace in the midst of this. No, I was worried. I was terrified. But God, I'll tell you that there are times in your life when everything seems to be going wrong, that if you put your mind on God, you will have peace when everything else is going on around you. The way I picture that when I hear about peace beyond understanding is when I think about Jesus in that boat. The disciples were all around him and they were worried they were going to drown. Don't you care that we're going to drown? And Jesus said, <sighs> He wasn't worried. He had peace in the midst of the storm. He knew. He already knew the outcome. And maybe that's the thing. Maybe it's that because we are concocting the outcome 
instead of knowing the outcome. God is not ordained for you to fail. God is not ordained for you to... He says, I, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a future and a hope. If God has given you plans to give you a future, has plans to give you a future and a hope, what are you worried about? God works all things for, my, for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. He gives you peace beyond understanding. He gives you joy that is unexplainable. Why are you so happy? Look at your life. You're, you're in a, you're, 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 your whole family's falling apart. Your, your kids don't want to serve God. Your hus husband or your wife just left you, and you're, you're happy. What, what's, what is this all about? I have the peace that passes understanding and the joy that is unexplainable. I don't know what, I can't understand it, can't explain it to you. Unless you know God like I know God, I can't explain it to you. He's the peace in the midst of that storm. He knows your end from your beginning. He knows your, he knows the end of your story better than you do. Because he's the author and the, fin I like that, the author and the finisher of my faith. So you aren't destined to fail yet because God ain't finished writing your story. It's still got a happy ending at the end. And you just got to be able to put your faith and your trust in God to know that he's taking care of you. I like Jeremiah 20, Je Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 7 and 8. It says this, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Watch the verse 8. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends, it sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when, when heat comes. It leaves, its leaves always, are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. I love that. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, his, whose confidence is in Him. you got to get your roots down into the things of God. you got to get down into that place where you say, I'm going to get rooted in God. Like the old church mamas, you know, the old church mamas. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. But mama, aren't you where God's got it? He's in control. He knows my end from my beginning. He's not going to let me fail nothing. You know, we're all like, ah, ah, ah. And he, we're like, she's like, child, just trust God. He's got you. We got to get to that place where you say, you know, God has my back. God has my back. God knows my heart. God knows my heart. God knows my soul. God knows my mind. God knows me. He knows that, the, he knows that as long as I put my trust in him, he's never going to fail me. And God's just waiting for you. He's just waiting. He's waiting for you to say, God, you're in control. You know, and we are blessed when we trust God. The word blessed means that, that we are filled with divine benefits. That's what blessings are. They're divine benefits. Why do you think, why do you think people want to come to America? Hmm? They want to come to America because of the benefits. You have the freedom of speech. You have the freedom to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You have, the, you have the freedom to start a business. You understand that 53% of most immigrants that come to America come with the intention of starting a business. And here we are in America, and we got a lot of Americans who don't want to work. Send them all back to Mexico or wherever. They come in with the idea that they want to start a life here. Can I just be honest? You're going to be like a tree that's planted by a stream of water. I love that. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man who, who, whose trust and confidence is in the Lord. When, when, when the heat comes, that means when the heat comes, he's not afraid. When trouble comes, he's not worried. His leaves are always green, which means he always remains steadfast and healthy, even in the midst of a trial.
He don't let trials push him away from the things of God. Instead, he don't let trials push him away from God. He lets those trials push him down onto his knees to trust God and pray to God and to talk to God. He never worries in a year of drought. He never worries, oh, you know, I don't know if I'm going to bear any fruit. No, he remains constant even in those times of lack, constant in those times of testing, constant in those times of, of, of hardship. He remains faithful and trusting God. He never fails to bear fruit. In other words, he keeps on producing results. That's what fruit is. Producing results. I remember leading a, uh, leading a team one time, a discipleship team. We had gone out to minister, and everything that could ever go wrong went wrong. Uh, we blew a fuse on the amplifier. We... Uh, one of our speakers was not working. It was crackling, and we were trying to trying to get it to work. And we l forgot the, uh, the the new cord at home. And then uh, the, one of the costumes wasn't working and wasn't fitting. And and we were doing all of these things. And I said, I I said, what is going on? Let's find out what's going on. And all I heard were excuses, excuses, excuses. Well, I would have, I would have, I would have, I would have, but I would have, but I would have. And I said, I said, stop, stop. All I hear is excuses. What we need to do is pursue results. In, as believers, even as a leader, leaders, you're not a leader if, if you're allowing other people to finalize your results. You've got to be the kind of person that says, listen, <laughs> I'm a problem solver. God put me in this in this." this opportunity to solve a problem. And listen, as a believer, God put you in that position not to solve the problem, but to trust the one who solves the problem. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. There was a time several, quite a few years ago that Pastor Rose and I were um serving in another church and we had a, a strict financial need that we needed to take care of and we had not only just a financial need but a health a health need our daughter Jasmine who you see sings on stage and sometimes writes some of our worship songs she was needing a heart transplant and I told my wife I said you know what I'm not I'm, I'm gonna fast for the next 21 days until God does something Seven days into the fast, I'm sitting there in the living room and I'm trying to read my Bible and nodding off. <laughs> and Pastor Rose, in all of her wisdom, said, "Are you, are you fasting for to know the to know God's plan, or are you fasting to get God to answer your demands?" In other words, are you on a hunger strike? Say, I'm not doing, I'm not going to eat, God, until you give me my way. Or are you fasting so that you can know what God's will is? And I'll tell you that that has stuck with me for all these years. When I get worried, I fast. I pray. So that I can know what the will of God is. What does he want me to do? And I'll tell you right now the will of God for you in regards to worry. Everybody say, what? Thank you. I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> when, you, when worry comes, instead of giving into that fear, sometimes you just got to shake it off. Right? Shake it off and go, nope. I'm not going to give in to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust God. But understand that you can't trust God if your heart is not full of his word. If your heart is not full of feeding the word of God and nurturing the, word, the, the, the faith within you, if you're only living on, on Sunday's messages and you're not, you're not feeding and nurturing that word every single day, don't expect yourself to stay strong spiritually. You've got to get to that place where you say, you know, Pastor, I, I'm so glad that you feed us on Sundays. 
but I also feed myself during the rest of the week. Beginning next month, we're going to make group discussion guides available for you that you can take home and have discussions with your family. That you can take home and, and extend your personal, your, your personal study time as you begin to grow in your walk with God. Because I want you to grow. As your pastor, I want you to grow and not be worried. I want you to have faith in God and not be worried. <coughs> I want you to close your eyes. I want you to bow your heads. How many of you would say, Pastor, I've been, I've been worried. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you, fear has just got, my, got a hold of my heart right now. I keep giving in, and I, I try as hard as I can not to, not to worry, and I, and I know I, I say I trust God, but it, I always seem to just go right back to fear and worry. Pastor, I want God to take that worry out of my life. I want to leave this church today knowing that God is in control. If that's you this morning, I want you to stand right where you are.